Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. If you're wondering what I'm excited about, I don't have any Kleedex. <laughs> So if you wait until my director here throws or handles me, there you do. <laughs> you know, it's been a long time since we've been together. It sounds that way, doesn't it? Anyway, here we are. I hope you had a great season. I hope that the Lord was bountiful to you in many graces. Strange thing about gifts, you know. Sometimes you give away more than you got. Did you ever do that? Huh? Well, I was bursar as a nun. What's that mean? It means I was a bookkeeper. It's a nicer word, though. And I used to, one of my obligations was to. Yeah, make up the little Christmas boxes. They looked like old cigar boxes. You didn't get much, you know. Nothing really to get excited about, but the curiosity got you and you wonder what was in it. It was my idea, my responsibility to put something in it. And we used to have a custom of a pinwheel. I didn't even have them anymore. Little pinwheels and you had some three, we were supposed to have three pins, that was it. And so I got brand new pinwheels and I, I put pins in them, you know, the nicest colored pins I could find. And I put those in those pinwheels. And, and there were 24 at the time. And uh, two weeks after Christmas, I got 28 back. <laughs> I thought, now where did they come from? See, so that's what happens sometimes at Christmas with gifts. Um, but the spiritual gifts never leave us. Um, that's something that's so important. And I think it's something that we kind of lose sight of in this day and age when we always look for, you know, possessions and all these kind of things. We forget that the most important thing in our whole life is what goes with us. What gift is never ending? What is it I do that I will find in heaven? Nothing you have, possessions, uh, we will find in heaven. You know, you won't be cold. And somebody's going to go through all your chest of drawers and, hey, my God, I didn't know she had that. <laughs> Somebody else will go through the next drawer and say, just what I needed. If you got any money, it's going to be blown, or your family will fight forever for it. That's why I suggest you give it away before you die. I know a great place for that. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't often think of, what is it I do? And you know the Lord said it was so sweet of him. He said, you know, if you give a cup of cold water, I thought that was nice to say cold, don't you? Could have given a cup of water. And in those days, to get a cup of cold water, you had to go to the well and let down a pail and then crank it up again. It wasn't an easy thing to get a, a cup of cold water. 
But see, that cup of cold water you'll find in eternity. Isn't that great? It just isn't Boy Scouts helping old women across the street. At least they used to do that. Do they do that anymore besides selling cookies? What do they do? Anybody know? No Boy Scouts here. But see, it's, it's more than that. Then if you count, not only what you do for your neighbor, but what happens to you. I thought we would have a rather disagreeable subject this evening called conversion. Now, nobody thinks, hardly anybody thinks they need conversion. Do you need conversion? No. I can hear you, see you shaking your head. No. You're good. You go to Mass. You go to confession. You do all the things you're supposed to do. But do you seek after holiness? All those things are wonderful. And the gates of heaven will be open to you. But do you go that extra mile? Every day we have to have some kind of conversion. Oh, I don't mean from a great sinner to someone who wants to love God. That's a great conversion. I mean the little ones, the little things, the little hot tempers you got, the little acts of impatience. Do you know you do these things? See? What is it in your life that needs converting, what needs changing, that needs renewal? What is it? You want to tell us? Hey, chicken. I mean, we don't know you. We, won't, we don't know one voice from another. You could tell me you're in Timbuktu, and you could be down the street. I wouldn't want you to do that, though. <laughs> but you see, we all need some kind of conversion. Tell us what's hard for you. Maybe it's something like smoking. That you need more light than conversion, you know? You need to lower it and know you're killing yourself by the inches. If you don't know that, then you really need conversion. We all have one or two things that we do constantly. And it never changes. Do you ever notice that? Why doesn't it change? Are we just going to die the way we were born? No. Is it a hot temper? Do you make everybody miserable every time you blow your cool? Is it jealousy? She don't make a lot of resolutions. My producer this evening said, if I hear one more, if I listen to one more TV show and all they're going to give up for the new year is uh, they're going to diet, they're going to give up booze, and they're going to give up cigarettes. And all, do you want my opinion? My opinion is you shouldn't have those things anyway. They are good for you. I, I would like you to look inside. Do you think that everybody dislikes you? You may be right. But why? Nobody gets up in the morning disliking everybody or anybody. What are you doing that make people, are you jealous? Oh, that's a terrible thing. You have the power to change <coughs> because there is a Jesus. Because he came. He came as a babe. He came as one that's so small. He came as someone that you would not be afraid of, that you would look at and say, oh, wow. That you would feel compassion and hope. That you knew that even though you were a great sinner, if he, if he became that small just for you, he would forgive anything and everything. Do you have an unforgiving spirit, huh? Is that your problem this year? Somebody does something to you and you can't forget it. Is that it? Do you have a lust problem? 
It's sex so much on your mind that that's all you breathe, and all the dirty books you read. That's your problem. You got a really a biggie. Where do you need conversion in your life, huh? You know, some people live like they're never going to be judged. Well, believing it or not believing it doesn't make any difference. We're all going to be judged. You know what St. Paul says here? He says, you are part of a building that has the apostles and prophets for a foundation. And Jesus is our cornerstone. You know what else he says? We all grow into one holy temple in the Lord. Are you a holy temple? Hmm? Do you know that the Spirit lives in you, or he wants to? I would like to ask you, why do so many of you live in such a miserable way? You don't have peace, you don't have love. What, what is it? Whatever makes your spirit look like old dried up prune? Huh? What is it that makes you run so far from your own soul? You can't. What terrible imperfection do you have that you just seem to can't get rid of? We could pray for it tonight. Maybe we could talk it over. Maybe we can all pray for it. I want all of you that are out there that don't have a, seem to have a problem or know what your problem is. What a light that is. To know what's wrong with you is a great gift from God. Pope John the 23rd used to have a little sign on his desk that said, Know thyself. What a grace it is to know yourself. So those of you who know yourself, well then let's pray for those who don't. They know there's something wrong, but they're kind of limbo, you know? They don't know where they're going or why. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. This is Barbara from uh, Worth, Illinois. Uh-huh. And you, you were saying, I was wondering about our prayer life or having a prayer life and yeah. perseverance in that. Yeah. I, I'm not sure exactly what exactly is the prayer life. Is that praying all day with a good intention, or is it... <laughs> certain prayers that you pray at a certain time? That's a very good question for the beginning of the year. There's all kinds of prayer. There's vocal prayer, like you say the rosary. There's liturgical prayer with that wonderful mass. There's a prayer of meditation where I, I put myself in the presence of God and I, I put myself in one of the times our Lord lived and, and I, I'm there with him. There's meditative reading, like if I, if I was reading that part about the gospel, huh? and uh, I mean the gospel where our, our, the apostles were uh, in a boat and our, our Lord had his head in a, on a cushion, St. Mark says, and he was sound asleep and the waves were coming over and the apostles were scared. Now can you imagine that? I can imagine that. I can imagine Peter saying to John, wake him up. And John saying, no. Here comes another wave. <laughs> they're getting all kind of pails and they're paling out. Andrew says, I think you ought to wake him up. John said, no, he's tired. So they keep out with that water. And it keeps coming in and they keep piling it out. And Peter said, I told you to wake him up. This is not written in scripture now. It's my rendition. <laughs> I make it a meditation, okay? And John said, no, I'm not going to wake him up. So Peter goes and he shakes the Lord. He said, Lord, we're drowning. Don't you care? Oh, what a thing to say to God. Haven't you said that sometime? Yeah, we all have. Don't you care? 
Lord, I can't get out of this situation. I prayed and prayed, don't you care? Our Lord woke up and he said to the magnificent wind that storm, be calm, be quiet. He went down. They looked at Peter, you know, you gotta have the look of Jesus. There's two times the Lord looked at Peter, probably more, but the ones that I like the best is this time and the one when Peter was warming himself at the fire, had just denied the Lord three times and the Lord passed by and looked at him. Oh, the look of Jesus. And our Lord said to them, oh, men of little faith. How is it you have no faith? Ooh, <laughs> it's a little, that no faith. Well, you see, if you were making a meditation, you could really say to yourself, yeah, that's me, Lord. There are times I have little or no faith. Well, after you did that, you see, you would get courage and strength to say, I'm going to, in the storms of my life, I'm going to trust Jesus. So that's a meditation. Now, these are times of prayer, see, that I'm talking about right now. Then there is a contemplation where you just look at Jesus. You don't have anything to say, really. You say, well, I don't know anything about that. Oh, come on. You all know something about that. If you love your wife or husband, whatever it is, would you say that sometimes when you just sit down holding hands and don't say anything, you said a lot? Wouldn't you say that? Yeah, that's how it is with the Lord. Sometimes you're just happy to be in his presence. Now comes the unceasing prayer. That's what you're talking about. That's prayer of the heart. You know, Our Lady keeps asking the, uh, many visionaries all over the world to pray the prayer of the heart. Well, say I was making a cherry pie for someone I love, okay? Now, I got to think about the ingredients, don't I? Or I'm not going to have a cherry pie. I may have something, but it's not going to be a cherry pie. I may have a tart. Somebody brought me a peach pie one time. I looked at it, but I couldn't find it. It was that big. And I said, oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> So something went wrong, see? But even though you would be thinking about that cherry pie and the recipe, who was it for? Someone you love. If I am doing everything I do for Jesus, trying to live the gospel, if you're driving after for the kids and pick them up from school and you, you some guy behind just tooting a horn, I hate that. <laughs> I think that's so rude. In Italy, they do it a lot. One person starts and everybody, they don't even know why they're tooting. One time, a person did that to me. Eugene was driving me somewhere and he started tooting and I, uh. So he got angry, he passed us by. I'm kind of glad he passed fast. Because <laughs> the things I was thinking, I could have never said, but I sure was thinking them. The most beautiful part of this whole situation was that he had to stop for a red light. <laughs> and we backed up behind him, and I went. <laughs> 
and I did it with a vengeance. <laughs> now, <clears throat> you wouldn't say that was a spirit of prayer, you see, because it wasn't unceasing. It somewhere it stopped dead. <laughs> but the fact I didn't say what I thought, I tried to wave at him with love. At least I don't think I stopped loving Jesus or, or even ceased praying because it took all everything in me not to do something. I didn't do it. Sometimes we think prayer is something so easy and so loving and you just feel so good. Well, good luck, sweetheart, because it ain't going to happen. Do you think our Lord felt good, the agony in the garden? Do you think he felt good when he was slapped and before Caiaphas and, and Pilate and Herod? Do you think he felt good? No. In no other time was he so pleasing to the Father. If you do everything you do for the love of Jesus, throw these little darts out once in a while, Jesus, I love you. Talk to him as a friend talks to a friend. Tell him everything. I think we let God out of our lives because we don't think he's interested. I'll tell something on myself because I don't have anybody else to tell him. We dedicated the shortwave last 28th of December and the man who paid for it was there and he flew 8,000 miles to get there. And the, the day before, I prayed so hard that it would be a beautiful sunny day. Because we didn't put a nickel towards that shirtwave. He paid for all of it. I wanted him to see the towers. But it was so foggy, you could hardly see one hand in front of the other. So after we all got into the building, I said a few words. I said, Lord, why are you doing this, huh? I mean, he, he paid all this money for this thing, and he came 8,000 miles. He can't even see a tower. Why are you doing this? So I started saying my rosary, and I came out. It was even more cloudy than it was before. <laughs> and I prayed a little more, and I went peek around the corner. And by this time, I mean, that fog was so thick. And I said, OK. I don't care. <laughs> if you don't want him to see it, it's OK with me. And the Lord said something to me. He said, I want to be here too. And suddenly I remember the Israelites. A cloud followed them during the day and a fire at night. And when the Egyptians were under heels, a thick, thick fog came along so bad that they couldn't move. Gave the Israelites time to keep moving ahead. I said, sorry, Lord. My poor mind is so stupid. It does not look beyond. Neither does it see those invisible realities that are so far above our human thinking. At that point, I looked at that fog with great joy. So we went down and we had lunch at a little hotel, came back up for him to push the switch. <coughs> and it was clear as a bell. My prayer was an imperfect one, and one that 
black faith, really, because I was so sure he had to see it right then and there. But I learned something, and I hope you learned something from my experience. That when God doesn't do the things we'd like him to do, when we like him to do it, we can trust he too wants to be there with you. So I would say to you that that unceasing prayer is just an attitude of mind and heart. That when temptation comes, you say, oh, I don't want to hurt him. When the time of virtue comes, you say, oh, I want to be like him. In between, you can be sweeping a rug or driving a car. But gradually, as you talk to him about everything, a driver who honks a horn, a fog that comes in at the wrong time. You're talking to him. You'd be surprised. So don't put all your prayer in times of prayer. Talk to him about everything. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Hey, where are you from? I'm from Florida. My name is Antoinette. Ah, what can I do for you? I'm very happy that you're back. I've been praying for you. Thank you. I, I just have a comment. I yeah. was um, thinking over the new year coming in, and I decided I would not say anything about anyone unless it was going to be something good. Praise God. And, uh, and if someone hurt me, which usually does happen because I'm so gullible all the time, and instead of getting angry, I decided I would pray for them. Yeah. And the only problem is, I have a husband who's the opposite. <laughs> he, he thinks I should agree with him whenever he's putting people down, and yeah. I don't like to do that. It, yeah. it really makes me feel very bad to put people down. And I just don't know, you know, how, how do you handle something like that without um, getting into <coughs> trouble? I, well, pray, I pray all the time for yeah. him, too. I he think just he, happens to be a person who likes to think he knows everything. A lot of those around. I think you should do what you're doing. If we get a little persecution, I, I, you see, you don't have an alternative. You, you just can't backbite and say something nasty just to please someone. I think you're bugging him. That's what makes him so angry, see? One time a woman came to me and she said she wanted to do something for Lent, and I said, well, don't gossip on the phone for all of Lent. What will I talk about, she said. I said, I don't know. <laughs> Try God, you know. <laughs> Try the weather, anything. She came back in two weeks, she said, I'm going crazy, I'm going crazy. <laughs> See, we get in the habits of just pulling people down all the time, and we can never raise them up. So I, I think if you just keep on, pray for him, pray for him. Next rosary, you say you're offered for him. It's a very powerful prayer. But know for sure you're reaching him. One day he'll shock you and say something real nice. I think that's your example. I could tell by your voice you're a rather gentle person. Don't be anything else but what God made you. A lot of people work hard for what you find easy. You hang in there and just pray for him. We'll pray for him, too. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. How are you from? I'm from Chicago. Wonderful. What is your question? Okay, Mother Angelica, my question is that I'm trying to my best to pray in my house to go to church, but there's sometimes that I just cannot pray. I tell lies. I swear, I get mad, and I'm the only one in my house that usually prays, but there's other members of my family that they just criticize me or they make fun of me when I take the rosary or when I start going to church, and they just, you know, use me as if I was a clown and in front of other people, and I feel really bad. And believe me, I feel sometimes like taking them by the neck and squeeze them. And how could I do 
so I can live a saintly life and yeah. keep on praying and forgetting my, about all these sins that probably uh, hurt my Lord yeah. and hurt me. Well, you know, it's a common problem. St. <coughs> Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. I think the problem perhaps that people have is that your prayer life doesn't go with your other life, see? In other words, you have to realize that it's more than just saying prayers. That prayer has to make you want to be like Jesus. So you have to stop gossiping, swearing. One time, I built, when I was a young sister, I built, uh, my superior asked me to build a, a shrine uh, like Lourdes, and that's all she said, just like that. Well, so I called some of the good people I knew, and nobody had time. I called some of the holy people I knew, and they had less time. So I was born in the rather uh, different end of town, and I called the pool room where I was raised, not in the pool room, but around the pool room. And I, I, I got a hold of this voice, and I recognized it. And I said, Pizzagill, is that you? Yeah, mother. Well, was sister then. What can I do for you? I said, why don't you get out of jail? <laughs> he said, oh, a month ago. I said, are you being good? What can you do in a month? <laughs> so I said, uh, I need some of the boys to help me build this <coughs> one. Ah, sure. How many do you want? Five or six? Okay. So every night at five o'clock, supposedly after work time, but I never knew what kind of work they did. So um, they would come. And one uh, with a truck driver for a concrete um, place, and I said to him, I need moss rock. All right, I'll go find moss rock for you. I said, I need a lot of it. And he used to swear, very much probably like you do. And every five, six word is a swear word, you know. And he'd do it in front of me. I said, Jim, Tony, why don't you stop swearing? Honest to God, sister, I don't mean it. <laughs> I said, it's fine, but you're still saying it. So why don't you stop? Try this whole week. I'll have to shut up. I said, it may not be a bad idea. <laughs> shut up. So, the week was got over, and he came to me, and he said, I did it. I said, you swore. Hell no, he said. <laughs> <sighs> he was crying hard. See, he didn't swear all week. But he had to use it as emphasis, say, <laughs> well, why don't you try that? Try one thing at a time. You don't need to swear. You don't need to gossip. You don't feel good. And that's why everybody laughs when you pray, see? My life must be, at least people have to see I try. I'm going to fall here and there, but I try. So you try. Will you do that? I'll pray for you. Like I did him. You know, I worked with those men for about, oh, must be three, four months. And they didn't know much about prayer. And they were brought up on a wrong side of the street. But they had big hearts. And that's when I learned something. I learned why the Lord said one time, I have come for sinners and not the just. 
And I learned why sinners always were attracted to the Lord. They needed him, and he loves to be needed. You need Jesus to stop swearing and gossiping. It's not something you can do. It's something he must do with you and in you and for you. Don't swear. And don't gossip. It brings no one anything. And if what you say is not true, that's even worse. So tonight, ask our Lord, our Lady, to help you. We have another call. Hello? Hi. Hi. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Pueblo, Colorado. Ah. And what is your need or question? My need is my compulsive stealing and uh, smoking and a whole collaboration of everything. I've been trying every way possible to uh, stop it, going to church every day. What do you steal? C cigarettes mainly. Cigarettes? And, yeah, cigarettes. And it's, uh, I got a bad habit of it, and I've tried maybe about five, six times to stop, but I just can't not. And do you work? No, I'm on Social Security Disability. And I've been trying to go to church every day and go to confession as many as times as possible, but I still have the guilt feeling. Yeah, you should. And I don't know how to repl uh, take care of it. Like this Christmas Eve, I went out and uh, gave out free coffee and donuts and treats to the homeless rather than uh, giving presents out to other people. I felt good in helping them, but it was such a, it cost me a lot of money. And I've been trying to, uh, how do you say, uh, I, I feel like I'm punishing myself in many ways because I could use that money for my own food and all this kind of job, but I've been trying to help other people just to punish myself for sitting all the time. And I don't know what else to do. I, I just need a better willpower. Yeah, you do. I think besides willpower, you need love. you got to love Jesus. You go to church, but it's just kind of an action you do as a kind of... Do you, I wonder if you go to confession. Oh, yes. I try to go about two, three times a week. You go and three times a week? Yeah. In fact, Father's getting uh, mad at me, so I've been going to three different churches. <laughs> trying to, because I still have the guilt feeling, and I know that... You get a kick out of stealing, or do you really need those cigarettes? I, I feel like I need the cigarettes, otherwise I really go well, up if, the why wall. Well, why do you give to the poor and then steal for cigarettes? That's a good question. I, usually when I steal for the cigarette, I don't have any money. And I know, but you see, if you're giving, let me, let me say this. This, this. You have misguided compassion. Say a man has a paycheck, and he's got rent and gas and electric, and he's got food for his children, his wife, and rent, and he sees a beggar on the street, and he gives him his entire paycheck. That's misguided compassion. See, he's got to take care of his wife. Now, maybe he could maybe make a sacrifice and give the beggar $5, but he's got to realize he's got to do accomplish the will of God. He has to feed his family. See, that's misguided compassion. And you're in a vicious circle. You steal, and then to make reparation for your stealing, uh, you, uh, you give to the poor. But see, that giving to the poor may make you feel, but has no merit before God, because you, you keep in a state of sin. I would suggest if you need to smoke, which is kind of dumb in itself, if you're on Social Security and, and you don't have the money, you can't afford that kind of thing. I would ask the Lord to give you the grace to stop smoking. Then you don't need to steal. But most of all, if that's a craving you have, that you can't get rid of it, I would begin to, to cut it down. If you smoke two packs a day, cut it down to one, then cut it down to a half, and you cut it down to three a day. But you, you can't do that. See, I would give less to the poor and buy your cigarettes if you have to have them. 
I think if you really want to do something and your will is weak, when your will is weak because you constantly weaken it by doing this, see? So I would, I would do that if I were you. I would go and talk to Father. Say, Father, how, how do I get rid of this, see? I would get rid of smoking. You don't need that. I could tell by your voice you don't need it. You're hurting yourself and, and just running around buying presents for buddy. You're on Social Security. You can't afford to do that. You could do a little, but your obligation is to pay your rent and gas and electric and eat. See, you don't even have, have money for food. So I, I would rethink it and I would go to some priest and ask for counseling. No wonder he's tired, you see, but you don't really have purpose. You have purpose and amendment, that's fine, but you see, you got everything mixed up. Give less, give up your cigarettes. Then you can give more and live a very free life. Let's say Hail Mary for him, Hail Mary for her grace. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, for us sinners. No. Yeah, I'm we just got a call from a, a girl whose name is Rita. She is dying of cancer. And I would like to ask you, Rita, since you're dying of cancer, to be very brief. To know that one day soon you will see the most beautiful face in the whole wide world, in all of heaven. Jesus. And all the pain will be gone, and all the anxiety and frustration. I want you to give these last moments or days totally to him. I want you to say to him, Lord, I give you my pain, my misery, my body is so. I, I give you my life, and I put my death in your hands. I desire nothing but your holy will. Well, I think with something like that, when you see him, you'll go right to heaven. Because cancer is a fearsome thing. And there's another man that's listening to me now who also has cancer. Don't be afraid. It's a short pain for a beautifully long, joyful, wonderful eternity. The pain we have here is as nothing compared to the glory that is to come. I would ask both of you to pray for a very special intention of mine for the honor and glory of God. And when you get to see him face to face, tell him or ask him, please keep Mother Angelica out of trouble. <laughs> because we're about to take another risk for his glory. We have another call, hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Where are you from? I'm from Rhode Island. My name is Deb. Uh -huh. um, there are many things I'd like to kick out of my life. <laughs> um, but I think if I start with pride and really embrace humility, which gives me cold sweats, um, that why, would be a why, why, why did she give you cold sweats? Uh, oh, gosh. You know the way Our Lady humiliated herself into the dust and Our Lord... Um, he was so scorned and uh, spit upon, and I had these. I envisioned these things happening to me, and I just, I just it like won't, crumbled. It won't. It won't. It won't. No. It's never happened to me. Humility is different from humiliations. Only a humble person can accept humiliations, but many times, most of us will never get all those things that our dear Lord and Our Lady suffered. Humility is truth. That's what uh, Teresa of Avila said. But what is truth? Truth is to acknowledge 
that without him I have nothing and I am nothing and I'm worth nothing. That he is the one who is the author of all good things, whether I, in any area I practice virtue, in any accomplishments we have, it's all him. Humility, it consists in acknowledging the true source of my life, of my talents, and of myself. So if someone should criticize me, I'm not upset. Why? Well, it's true. If it isn't true, it could be. Sin doesn't come from God. Lust doesn't come from God. But if you really love your neighbor, then that goodness in you comes from the Lord. Now, if you acknowledge that truth, how could you be humble? How could you be proud? And why wouldn't you be humble? I don't think humility is a hard thing. It's a total acknowledgement that everything good comes from him. Then you can rejoice in it. And if someone were to insult you, like uh, we have in the Franciscan order, uh, Brother Juniper. Most people today would think he's kind of wacko. But St. Francis said he wished he had a forest of junipers. Well, one day, I'm not promoting this, please understand. One day, a brother was dying, and they asked for a pig's foot. I think they're pretty good myself, especially when they're pickled. <laughs> brother Juniper was a very simple brother. He didn't have any pig's feet. So he went out and cut off one foot from a pig and prepared it for this dying brother. Well, the farmer was not too happy about a three-legged pig. <laughs> So he took the poor pig and he brought it to Holy Father to the to the superior, and he knew everybody knew as soon as they looked at the pig who did it. <laughs> everybody. So the man comes and he acknowledges, you know, he's sorry his his uh, his um, brother did such a terrible thing. And the farmer said, "Well, what am I going to do with this thing now? You can have it all." So they got the whole pig. When Juniper came home, the father scolded him long and hard, to the point we got hoarse. Couldn't talk anymore. And in the middle of the night, like 2 o'clock in the morning, Brother Juniper comes and raps on the superior's door. He says, Father, when he got the door open, the father's provincial sitting there, standing there looking at him. He said, Father, I perceive today that when you scolded me, you got hoarse. And so I bought some porridge here to soothe your throat at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, if I was a superior, and one of my sisters woke me up at 2 o'clock in the morning with a bowl of oatmeal. I don't want to even think what I do. <laughs> but in this case, both Superior and Brother Juniper were beautifully humble. And the Superior said, come in, Brother. We'll eat it together. Well, you see, Brother Juniper acknowledged he was wrong. He acknowledged the period did well to scold him so bad. His only concern was he got hoarse in the process. See, that was a kind of humility that was free. Humility makes us free. We're free. You can't insult a humble person because they believe everything you say about them. Now, if you said something wasn't true, they would acknowledge it. If they had the opportunity, it probably would be true. So I don't think you ought to equate uh, humiliations with humility. I neither do I think that if you read a spiritual book, everything in that book could have happened to you. I used to read two or three books a week. Nothing I ever read ever happened to me. 
I don't think our Lord knows I don't have the humility or the courage or whatever. I only have what God feels I can bear. You trust the Lord. Will you do that? If you want to read a book, read it for your edification. And don't think for a minute the Lord's going to pile something on you that you can't take. So if somebody praises you, thank God. If they don't think you're God's gift to humanity, thank God anyway. And you'll be humble. See how easy that is? We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from Berlin, Connecticut, and my name is Georgette. And what can I do for you? Well, my New Year's resolution was to have a closer walk with, with my God this year. Wonderful. It's been It's been a good journey up to now, and each year I feel the growth, you know? Yeah. And if you're, if you're really open, it, it, messages and signs and all these things really do come to you. Right. I have a question about the title, and I just discovered that God, the word God itself, is a title. It, now, am I on target there, Mother? You mean Yahweh? No, God. You know, like the word G-O-D? Is that Father. not a title? Father, that's his... That's his. That's his nature. His department. That's his nature. He's, he is almighty. God means almighty. It means holy. Right. But, yeah. but my, my question is, is it a title? No, it's his being. It's not a title. No, it's his whole being. God is God. He's supreme. He's holy. He's infinite. He has fantastic attributes. We call him God because that's what he is, the one only true God. Now, we have all kinds of Jesus' name is means Savior. And, and, and he was named Savior because that was his mission. Um, Paul, or J uh, Peter, was, was, went from, from uh, um, Simon to Peter because his mission was to be a rock. Saul went from Saul to Paul. Now, there are missions, and sometimes the Lord changes our name for those missions. That's why we change our name in religious life. We are spouses of Christ. We change our name. We have a new life, and we belong to Jesus. So I, I, I'm not too sure of your question, but I don't think, uh, you know, God is divine. The Lord is divine. The people wouldn't even say God. They said Yahweh. But God is the one only true God. And when we say God, we're talking about that infinite being, creator, provider, omnipotent, omniscient, transcendent, all these wonderful attributes. There's only one like him, and he's divine. Now, I'm going to make some comments on conversion. When you know, like all oh, the people today, knew something was wrong, pick one thing. Don't try to hit it off. You're not playing, uh, you're not bowling, you know? You've got to hit all those little pins at one time. In life, you're lucky if you hit one. First of all, ask our dear Lord and Our Lady to help you, first of all, in the Holy Spirit, to see what is your major fault. What is the one you fall into most of the time? 75% of the time, it's always this one. Tackle it. But not without prayer. Ask God with a sincere heart, Lord, I want to be like you. I want to overcome this. If you have a temper, think before you speak. If you're impatient, say a prayer. If you're lustful, think of the purity of Jesus and Mary. Ask for grace. Whatever's wrong with you, remember there's a little... Uh, what do they would call these things in the back of your car? Anyway, I read one. I said, God doesn't, didn't make junk. You're right. He doesn't make junk. He made you to his image and likeness. You have a dignity now that Jesus merited for us. You can go to heaven and call now God your Father. Huh? So, for that reason, Try to be like Jesus and try to be holy, and the Spirit will give you all the light you need. We'll see you tomorrow night. Bye.